We'll begin with a quotation, not from Nietzsche, but from someone who lived around the same time Nietzsche did, someone you could call one of his contemporaries, although a very different type of person from Nietzsche, still a man of letters, but a military man first. This is uh, Helmuth von Moltke the Elder in a quotation uh, from a letter that he wrote. Um, He's a man who helped create the Prussian Empire. This is a relatively famous passage. Um, goes as follows, quote, Perpetual peace is a dream, and it is not even a beautiful dream. War is an element in the order of the world ordained by God. In it, the noblest virtues of mankind are developed, courage and the abnegation of self, faithfulness to duty and spirit of sacrifice. The soldier gives his life. Without war, the world would stagnate and lose itself in materialism. End quote. In a way, those words read like a rebuttal to the central thesis of Immanuel Kant, a rebuke to the idea that perpetual peace is attainable, or even that it should be attained. That's just perhaps the more important point. War is envisioned here as a positive force in the discipline it creates, in its turning our eye away from materialistic concerns, centering our focus on altogether more important issues of life and death and existential moral questions of how we behave in the face of that. When there's an existential threat on your door, the importance of materialistic concerns seem to dissolve, right? And there's only that necessity to fight or to perish. And so in the course of war, one endures privation, one overcomes fear, and one has to be willing to sacrifice. For the only alternative is the destruction of all that you are and the loss of all that you hold dear. And so war in this passage from von Moltke is not just seen as a destructive force, but as a creative one. And what does it create? It creates virtue. It creates people. It makes them what they are, right? And that's a view of war that doesn't really exist anymore in the Western world today, although it was um, not unusual in the 19th century really at all. I mean, there are many reasons why our views on war have changed so much. I mean, one is the two world wars of the 20th century that were so destructive and claimed so many lives in such horrific ways. It altered our ability to view war as positive. Um, Another reason may be that the values of Immanuel Kant, among others, have sort of gained ascension. We no longer appreciate war as pragmatically necessary or virtue-creating in light of the fact of its moral abhorrence. That takes precedence, right, from the perspective of somebody like Kant, Um, which I would argue is uh, fairly widely adopted now. And so morality always sort of trumps necessity, you might say, in the human mind, Uh, whatever the reason may be. Moltke's type of view here becomes a voice from the past. It's a perspective that was once well within the Overton window, but now is so strange because the boundaries of what an acceptable viewpoint is have shifted. Helmuth von Moltke the Elder was an interesting man. He was a traveler to distant lands. He traveled to the Ottoman Empire, where he advised their military. Uh, He surveyed the Euphrates there, he traveled in Bulgaria, he saw the Dardanelles, and uh, commanding the Prussian troops, he fought the Danish, the Austrians, and the French. He was also an author. He was the man who reshaped the Persian military and created its doctrines. He guided the Prussians during the Austro-Prussian War and the Franco-Prussian War. That's the war in which the young Nietzsche served as a nurse while on leave from his duties at Basel University. Nietzsche had complicated feelings on this war, as we discussed in the Christmas episode, actually, but the long and short of it is that he disliked the narrow-minded cultural chauvinism of German society, which at that time had become stubborn and provincial, and he had a great respect for the French, whom the Germans were then attacking, and who were on the losing side of the war. And so Nietzsche's feelings on the war aside, uh, it's von Moltke whose strategies guided Germany in that war and led them to a shockingly swift victory over the French. Von Moltke's long-term impact was his role in the modernization of the entire Prussian state. 
He viewed war as carrying out the policy of the state by means of arms, and thus saw the military as the true essence of the state, the driving force of history even. We might recall Machiavelli's coinage that what is important in running your state is having good arms, for where there are good arms, there will always be good laws. It's a bit cheeky, but um, that's sort of the way von Moltke views things. Bismarck was always uh, uncomfortable with Moltke's geopolitical realism and his views of war. Uh, the autonomy of the military as first and foremost in importance sort of clashes with Bismarck's own approach, approach which was based on using the levers of government and uh, diplomacy uh, in order to achieve one's ends, right? But he couldn't deny that Molka was effective, and he wrote of him as a reliable soldier. And indeed, the German military victories against other powers on the continent, leading up to their quick domination of France in the Franco-Prussian War, re resulted in the German Empire's creation. So this new unified German state uh, is literally birthed out of war, right? Okay, so why are we opening the episode by talking about von Moltke? It's because his idea that war is part of this uh, divinely sanctioned moral order is something that sounds crazy to us, but made perfect sense in the context of his time. And that furthermore, his views on warfare emphasize not just the desirability of it, but its necessity or inevitability. And that we're, so we were on the heels at this time of the romantic reaction against the Enlightenment. And, you know, this reaction against these Kantian ideas of this everlasting peace and peaceful League of Nation States and mankind's reason elevating him and enlightening him beyond all those old, like, biological or irrational necessities of being human, right? Um, as well as all of the English philosophizing about social contract theory and how to establish a legitimate government of the people and these questions of rights and sovereignty that had been raised. Uh, there was then sort of the romantic reaction against that, which we might say Rousseau sort of um, preempts that, but particularly in Germany, v somebody like von Moltke represents something which might be called um, a part of that reaction against uh, this enlightenment view of mankind. In the late 19th century, we see something that might be called romantic militarism even which uh, was, in a sense, merely a return to the conventional wisdom that it existed during the time of the Renaissance, that war is part of the human condition, and that war has both positive and negative aspects. We can't simply will it away. Um, but all, centrally to this like romantic militarism, we have this idea of the military itself and thus the great military conquerors as this driving force within history, in contrast to, say, Hegel, Hegel says that the slave as part of the master-slave dynamic is the driving motor of history. Or in Marx, in the materialist analysis, who says that, broadly speaking, it's class warfare and the revolution of the underclass against the structure of material relationships. That's what drives history forward, right? I would argue, in fact, that where the romantic militarists have something of a point, it's to the extent that they more realistically assess power in geopolitics and understood geopolitics as this brute clash of competing interests um, which are mutually exclusive and that when uh, two parties have these existential interests and they collide and if they're armed and they feel like they can actually defend themselves or defeat the enemy in a military contest they will not r respect ideals of justice or anything like that um, it, they will not treat each other as if they're bound by some sort of common uh, social contract, or they won't re mutually respect one another's rights out of their own uh, capacity for reason. They'll engage instead in a test of rights. The very thing that Kant says reason must condemn wholeheartedly is that um, letting people test whether the somebody's rights should be respected by means of a test of might, right? Um, he says every, in, any man of reason has to reject this. But that is simply the reality when we look to the geopolitical um, level of analysis. And anyone who expects that a stronger party is going to respect the rights of the weaker when it's not in their advantage to do so, or where it may harm or hinder them in some way, you're always going to find that quite the opposite of that happens, right? That 
Anyone who runs a country this way, appealing to morality when brute force comes knocking at the door, is hopelessly naive. And so the realist take on geopolitics, which goes all the way back to Thucydides, sort of stands for all time against the moralistic interpretations of geopolitics, as Nietzsche himself pointed out, uh, sort of using the figures of Plato and Thucydides, idealism and realism. Beyond this, however, there is something about Nietzsche's views on war that goes deeper than simply the realist geopolitics of a Thucydides or a Machiavelli. There is something about war that is for Nietzsche almost on a metaphysical level, although I hesitate to say that, and I think it comes to him through the influence of Heraclitus. We'll recall here the perspective of Heraclitus that, quote, War is the father of all and king of all. He renders some gods, others men. He makes some slaves, others free, end quote. In another fragment, Heraclitus says, quote, Realize that war is common to all, and justice is strife, and that all things come into being and pass away through strife, end quote. These quotations are far more than piecemeal observations about life, um, you know, at least in the interpretation of Nietzsche, they're far more than that. As we know from his writings on Heraclitus, Nietzsche believes that Heraclitus' entire approach to understanding the world, um, which is to conceive of the world as this ever-living fire that kindles in some and is you know burns brightly in some places and is snuffed out or diminished in others, that view of the world's fundamental character necessitates this understanding of the world of physical phenomena as a sort of contest, we might say. That by conceiving of every individual phenomenon as being in its essence fire, and that it's all part of this ever-living fire that is constantly, it's like this surging flame, these surging forces that are constantly like clashing into one another. And that it is through this strife, right? This chaos that all things are made. That um, all ex- from which all existence comes, that right there is a vision of the world in which war is a creative force yet again. So, and we might compare, you know, Heraclitus saying that the essence of all things, or you know, the the actual elemental character of every phenomena is fire. Nietzsche sort of posits the thought experiment of seeing every distinct thing as a quantum of force, what he calls will force. But even though they sort of differ on what they call the quote-unquote essence of things, right, Um, which I think is kind of a silly question because both of them are sort of, they're trying to find poetic language to talk about the revealed character of the phenomenal world. They're not actually trying to split the world into two. But um, the key point in this interpretation is in seeing the world as an interaction between mutually exclusive and hostile forces. That in some sense, the question of the essence of phenomena is the wrong question because phenomena distinguish themselves in terms of their difference from the rest of all other phenomena. Like that's how we individuate by drawing a distinction between ourself and others. And um, for Nietzsche, this effect we have on one another can be likened to the idea of action at a distance of mutually opposed forces affecting one another, colliding with one another. Uh, the way we push against one another, define ourselves by our opposition to what is not ourself. Um, In some sense, what the very activity of life is for Nietzsche is, um, he says that, you know, what living things want is to discharge their strength. And uh, that, you know, happiness is the feeling of destroying all resistance to one's own particular pattern or way of being. So, uh, it's not really about what the true essence of phenomena is. It's about finding a way of describing, um, what would you say, existence itself, life itself, um, in the most complete possible way. Um, a lot of this, I think, will make a lot more sense if you uh, listen to the episodes on uh, the world is well to power and nothing besides uh, and the descent into materialism episode, but where we talk about Boscovich and how he tries to explain the entire physical world through one equation and that Nietzsche is trying to sort of mirror that in philosophy of explaining everything in the world through will to power, right? But to move on from that, so we've continually defined nature throughout this season as the war of all against all, um, which is a very old way of talking about the state of nature. And this is a very fundamental point for Nietzsche because 
this means that the state of war is the foundation of all life. Um, and it's because of this conception of what nature is that Nietzsche comes to his conclusions about inevitabilities within the political life. That's what places him in direct opposition to Rousseau, even though both are a reaction against the Enlightenment progress and reason as the savior of mankind. But they differ so fundamentally on this point in their conception of what nature is. There's that aspect of Rousseau's take on nature that makes nature seem, if not peaceful, like this state of balance or harmony. It's like an unselfconscious place of innocence where we live in the environment to which we are actually adapted. Nietzsche sees nature as a continual contest between beings with mutually hostile ends. So put simply, different organisms that eat one another to survive and have to defend themselves and their young from being eaten in a continuous struggle for being, occurring even on the smallest level, on the level of the microorganisms that live on us and in us and determine whether we're stricken ill or not, right? He doesn't think that this unselfconscious innocence ever really existed, or that there was ever a time when being alive was not this stressful, tense uh, struggle, struggle for existence, right? In short, an existence within a state of war, that to live is to constantly feel this struggle, and the struggle to reproduce oneself and one's own pattern or way of life. And seeking relief from this tension, from this struggle, is nothing more than the fatigue of one in old age, right? Or you might say it's a byproduct of all of our experiments in civilization and consequently in morality, um, you know, in a yearning for peace, the Sabbath of Sabbaths, the exoneration from the struggle, right? That this is sort of the expression of a, a life form that is old and tired, and that that's what happens to us over the course of civilization. But so this is why I think it's useful to consider Nietzsche's political ideas, because on the one hand, I think it's very clear that Nietzsche's perspective on nature is more honest and has the greater ring of truth to it than the perspective of a Rousseau. But if we do accept that, what are the implications of this? Right. So for Nietzsche, it's to see the periods of peace and stability as temporary and these warlike qualities as therefore eternally necessary. He therefore sees this genius of warfare figure as the highest type of person because the periods of peace and stability are something unusual. They're the exception to the rule, right? The city is born out of the desert and destined to be swallowed up into it again. And besides, you know, such an era of peace and stability only exists when such a political genius uh, creates it, brings it into being. So, these are sort of the consequences of Nietzsche's views on nature. If nature is the bella omnium contra omnis, the war of all against all, then civilization and the state of law and order, of peace and stability, and yes, therefore of morality, good and evil, all these things are sort of unnatural, right? Um, now, true enough, they come out of nature just as well, but they put man into a state of being which is contrary to the fundamental existence of like everything else in nature. Um, I mean, we can explain this through looking at one of Nietzsche's many coinages of morality as anti-nature, the good or bad conscience that we all live with as something imposed on us by herd living, which is to say generations of living within societies, right? The mild mannered person of education and good manners is this like delicate flower that emerges at the end of a culture's lifespan. It's something fragile and temporary and it falls to the ground, right? When the, the withering of culture, when the winter of culture arrives, the world of philosophy and the abstract is reconceived as a sort of escape from the brute realities of nature and the spiritual and religious worlds as something emerging from this collective reality imposed upon us by consciousness which is inherently communicative and therefore communal in its nature. The whole realm of ideas is nurtured within this um, existence that takes place within the framework of society. It's created by the power of the collective and the power of the state. The power of the state is this entity which seeks to preserve itself and its order for all time. And so ideas themselves are therefore in the domain of the collective, right? We seek to be coherent, to resolve contradiction, to find solutions, logical solutions within the world of ideas. But that always represents this 
sort of detachment from the warlike reality of the world, of the physical world, in nature as Nietzsche sees it. Irresolvable contradiction is not forbidden in nature. Rather, it's the rule. Instead of persistence as the rule among phenomena, Nietzsche says it's quite the opposite, right? Um, that all things are very impermanent, that they do not persist. A sensation is in fact most strongly felt when it is discharged in the least amount of time, right? Where uh, you get the most, when more sensation in less time is a way of measuring the intensity of a sensation. The briefest phenomena is the most powerful one. We might think of the flash of lightning. Whereas the phenomena that persists most steadily with the most constancy is hardly even noticed at all. We might think of the, you know, uh, law of gravity. Um, you know, it is so uh, such a part of the background of our lives that we don't even notice it. And so we fool ourselves in our very way of thinking, of conceiving of the world as this place of objects, you know, phenomena which persist and which are separate and distinct things with an essence, we think about the world that way because um, that's the very nature of ideas. But all of the very world of ideas um, in almost every way is sort of contrary to, in its sort of laws and the way that it operates to the entire natural world, which is why it's possible for us to have all of these moral ideas which are completely anti-natural, as Nietzsche calls them. And so what the world actually is to Nietzsche, as he tells us in his notes, is an endless play of forces. It's sort of this infinitely nested contradiction that never resolves itself. As he writes in Birth of Tragedy, it's a primordial pain and contradiction. In Beyond Good and Evil, and, and again in his notes, he says that the world is all will to power and nothing besides. So... The world is a struggle, a contest, and our departures from this are temporary illusions or abstract fictions. Peace is simply like a lull in this tempo of constant uh, combat. And idea ideas of achieving lasting peace, a perpetual peace, right? They will remain forever as only ideas. Um, as we discussed in the episode concerning Nietzsche's uh, differences with fascism, this is one of the key points that Nietzsche never sees an endpoint or a golden age or the reign of a thousand years as being at the end of the contest, right? The contest has no end, no purpose, no goal, no end towards which it's struggling, no end in the moral sense, right? There's no fascistic final solution, but also no Hegelian revelation of the absolute mind. There's no goal within the process that guides it. And each pattern which emerges victorious does not instate itself as a permanent form, but quickly finds itself supplanted by some other force. War is eternally recurring, as Nietzsche writes in The Gay Science. He sees the eternal recurrence of war and peace, of the revolution of strength conquering weakness and weakness overcoming strength, chaos giving rise to structure, structure succumbing to chaos. Now, I could see the objection that Nietzsche resists at other times any attempt at putting forward a world interpretation and recognizes all world images as simply the confession of its author, right? It's just simply their own perspective rendered into a worldview. That's the congen congenital defect of all philosophers, and it certainly applies to Nietzsche in this respect. But even if we reject Nietzsche's vision of the world as a metaphysical model, right? Let's just uh, throw that out from the beginning. There's something about the very act of rejecting all overarching world pictures, which seems to lend itself to this sort of view, though. Because if you reject any sort of uh, overarching like moral uh, direction, right, for the world, then you all you would have is like a continuous struggle between all sorts of different, like a multiplicity of different ends, right? Or different moral ends that uh, are relative, right? Nietzsche's vision of the world, it, it comes to him as a consequence of seeing that there is no absolute perceiver or ultimate perspective. What we have is a host of perspectives and 
since those perspectives are not all the same, they naturally come into conflict with one another. And using the will to power to interpret the world of phenomena, he naturally sees a world which is dispersed, which is a multiplicity, a play of you know, differing forces, rather than a monism or a directed deterministic universe or a mechanistic watchmaker's universe, right? If all phenomena are acting according to will to power, if every quanta of power draws its final consequence at every moment, then the world is not a machine. It's not a drama. Um, what it is is a sort of battleground. The outcome of each contest determines which pattern survives and which one perishes, uh, or which one imposes itself upon the world and which one doesn't. But rather than one coherent pattern to the world, there are perhaps innumerable ones, all of which are being tested against one another at every moment. And so that's the world that Nietzsche perceives. And so for him, war is only the same process. War, as we experience it on the geopolitical level, is the same process that occurs on every level of reality. That's just how it manifests in the social and political realm. But at every level of reality, for whatever, wherever you want to sort of arbitrarily draw the levels, um, this war is constantly being made manifest. And so... Nietzsche's views on war, I think you could also bring into this discussion the way he regards hardship and suffering, you know, the most tragic personal calamities, as things he wishes for his great souls to experience, right? The way Nietzsche reverses the valuations of pain and pleasure, as he um, says that the Greek did, the pagan Greeks, and regarding comfort as a danger, safety as a danger, wealth as a danger, well, meanwhile, regarding struggle as a blessing and challenge as a blessing, and yes, war as a blessing. And so, you know, you let the people with no courage flee from all these things. But the kind of person who has the capacity to take on pain and hardship will actually be better for it, right? And so, one of the most famous sayings of Nietzsche, right, is that which does not kill me makes me stronger. But rarely is the beginning of that particular maxim quoted. The full quotation is, quote, from the military school of life. That which does not kill me makes me stronger, end quote. So that particular nugget of wisdom, Nietzsche says he finds from the military school of life, right? Maybe this is the attitude that he perceived as being instilled into the recruits when he himself attended his military service. Or maybe it's simply his understanding of the military man, you know, springing from Nietzsche's psychological insights into this type of character, rather than anything in his personal experience. Who knows? The fact is that the saying of his, that which does not kill me makes me stronger, is an insight that has applications and people have found applications in all walks of life, all sorts of human endeavors, um, outside of the literal interpretation. But I think this elucidates the point I'm trying to make, that in the military outlook, in the perspective of someone who throws himself into that life or death, death struggle, Nietzsche finds invaluable insights that inform his entire project. And that aphorism, overused as it is, helps explain why we, he would have the view of war that he does. In some sense, it is simply, again, the Greek morality that Nietzsche is trying to revive and set in contradiction with the Christian, where value is not placed in the relief of suffering, but in the way that one uses suffering in order to accomplish their ends. That's why Nietzsche calls war essential in the section we looked at in Human All to Human, uh, the section A Glance at the State. And this is aphorism number 477. He writes in that uh, aphorism, quote, We know of no other means to imbue exhausted peoples as strongly and surely as every great war does with that raw energy of the battleground, that deep impersonal hatred, that murderous cold-bloodedness with a good conscience, that communal organized ardor in destroying the enemy, that proud indifference to great losses, to one's own existence, and to that of one's friends, that muted earthquake-like convulsion of the soul, end quote. I mean, the end of that passage, um, you could compare it to von Moltke, they hit on many of the same points, right? And Nietzsche goes on to write in this passage that nations that have attempted to steer their attention away from violent military conquests 
tend to man manifest these impulses nonetheless, but simply in other domains. And he uses the example of the British spending their national energy on these daring expeditions to foreign lands. That there is this need for the aggressive aspects of society to vent themselves onto the external world, the world beyond the protection of society, and importantly, beyond its moral laws. You see this theme in a lot of the writing in the era where colonialism is sort of winding to a close, uh, such as in the novel Heart of Darkness. You know, the whole novel is like the, uh, the confession of the, uh, the allure that the so-called civilized man feels to return to the wilderness, to go beyond the good and evil of his society or culture, right? To be a beast again. That's another way of putting it. Um, that's what war does. It, um, it satisfies the most base animal feelings and impulses that we have. Um, they're the most basic because that's what our survival depended on in the long arms race of evolution. And more than that, war sanctifies those feelings. War is painted over with the most glorious, divine, and idealistic notions. Epic songs and poems and, you know, in modern times, books and films are written about all the great wars. And in spite of the fact that the actual experience of being in war is quite horrifying and scarring for those involved, societies throughout history have always celebrated war and spoken of it in the most solemn and dignified terms. Nietzsche perceives this fact and makes no attempt to dispel any of these illusions about war, because I think he sees in this that same tendency he described in the ancient Greeks of making a festival for one's all too human, and thus placing this all too human aspect of ourselves outside the norm of society, yet making it sacred, right? So when we make war, we are really reverting to the same type of behavior that we have engaged in, um, you know, from the time when our common ancestors with the chimpanzees went and organized raiding bands and attacked one another and viciously ripped their opponents to shreds. The troop that did this most successfully dominated their territory and all of the, you know, chimpanzees that couldn't fight them for that territory knew to stay away. But of course, the behavior goes back even farther than that, since again, we, we could apply this warfare metaphor to every aspect of nature's selection pressures insofar as it is always a struggle for which organism or group of organisms will have the right to feed and thus to reproduce. Sometimes the struggle is between, you know, the feeding organism and the organism who's about to be eaten or who's struggling not to be eaten. But sometimes it's between two organisms who want the same feeding ground or the same stream or same patch of earth, whatever it might be. And so that, that you could say that behavior has been replicated since the time of, you know, just when there's just like amoebas going around eating each other, or, you know, whatever it might be. So this violent impulse for Nietzsche is as fundamental as the sexual impulse, if not more so. They're both so ancient that they're irrevocable parts of who we are as living beings. And yet, while it's all the rage these days to, um, you know, liberate the sexual impulse in various ways, I think Nietzsche would be the first to point out that our violent tendencies are just as in need of expression. Um, and, but it's never socially acceptable to, you know, indulge in your violent side, right? And that war, the return to the state of being where we vent those tendencies outward is therefore necessary. Barring that, you know, maybe some dangerous task or project that we can set for ourselves. Where we might get into danger would be in imagining that this violent tendency either doesn't exist or can simply be ignored or willed away, right? And so Nietzsche has a different view of war than we do in the modern age. And again, this is perhaps because he lived before the world wars and before the Holocaust and the dropping of the A-bombs and uh, decades of tension and paranoia at the thought of mutual annihilation uh, you know, not to mention things like the advent of chlorine gas and drone warfare and all these things. And we can never know if any of these developments might have changed his opinion on the matter, but I think we must admit it's quite possible that they would not have changed his opinion. Nonetheless, I think we have to evaluate his perspective with the fact in mind that none of these outcomes are known to him. And even if one argues that these events could have been predicted, they happened after Nietzsche's death. So, 
he can't really answer for any of these things. And it's funny, actually, I mean, a lot of people would say Nietzsche himself predicted these events, you know, with his warning that great wars would be fought in the next two centuries in the wake of nihilism and the death of God, that the battle for ide- which ideology was going to reign supreme, right? Man would rather will anything than not will at all. So there will be great wars of ideas, you know, in the next two centuries. I mean, maybe it is actually re- quite relevant to bring that up, right? Because Nietzsche's views on war, however uncomfortable you might find them, um, it does show a level of prescience for him to predict that because you could say that they were ideological wars. I mean, World War I is not normally considered an ideological war, but in many ways it is because it was basically... Um, governments that were republican in form against monarchies and it's basically the end of monarchy in europe and the start of the you know decolonialism and uh, world war ii was obviously an ideological war of liberalism versus fascism leading into the cold war of liberalism versus communism right so you know the nietzschean view of war is this ever recurring thing and the fact that well, you know, seeing how there would be this crisis of values, the way that it's going to be settled will be through war. Nietzsche was completely correct in that to some extent. And so maybe we should, you know, pay some attention to his views on war and the inevitability of war because there were people who believed in perpetual peace going all the way back to the time of Kant. And Nietzsche's telling them at the end of the 19th century, uh, don't count on that. Count on the, actually the greatest wars you've ever seen. He was actually correct in that regard. But I guess you could argue that um, in the time after that, they've called it the long peace, right? The time after World War II. And so we're kind of left to consider whether Nietzsche is correct, whether the world actually is this Heraclitean battlefield in which war is fundamental to the world of phenomena and thus ever recurring, you can't ever get out of it, or whether perhaps the promise of the end of history is correct, like the Hegelian dream could be reached of obtaining some point at which conflict itself could even be laid aside. And I don't actually think it's that easy of a question to weigh in on, because the Hegelian position has some interesting developments on its side, right, when it comes to like technological progress, the spread of knowledge, sort of the mutual self-awareness that's coming into being across all the world's societies now due to things like the internet. And yet the patterns of domination do seem to always recur. And it seems like most everyone is skeptical of the notion of reaching the end of history. Like we have an inherent instinctive skepticism towards things like that. Um, And on the other hand, if Nietzsche is correct, I think we're all a bit afraid of what such a truth might entail, though, if we fully embrace that. Because if there's ultimately no progress at all, and the shape of history is like a wheel, and war is just this eternally recurring thing, it's difficult then to call war a bad thing. Any more than we could call winter a bad thing. Or the fact that animals have to eat other animals to survive, is that a bad thing? It's just the reality, and we have to accept it as part of life. And so ultimately, my problem, if there is a problem that I could express with Nietzsche's view, is that his view could sort of instill a paralysis, I think, on the social and political world by telling us this, that nothing we do will really have any long-term effect, none of it matters, that can sort of have the effect of making you politically nihilistic. But it must be said, Nietzsche's great individuals are not politically nihilistic, right? Napoleon is not. <laughs> so could it really be such a great thing to take no care for the fate of your society and be like, ah, eh, it's just all cyclical anyway, why bother? I mean, even Heraclitus says in another fragment, quote, people ought to fight to keep their law as to defend the city's walls, end quote. Um, and so I guess the complication here to this metaphysical unmasking, right, of the world is simply conflict and all our moral ideas about it as this conscious gloss upon this hard reality of endless strife and struggle, you know, just our means of comforting ourselves in the face of that. The complication to that whole prospect is that the most motivated soldiers in war throughout history have always been rallied by big ideas, by grand political projects, by religious or moral crusades. It's a bit hard 
to conjure up that kind of enthusiasm with the notion of life as a cyclical, never-ending power struggle, right? No, every empire has always gone to war with a sense of moral rightness, with the idea that they were building some sort of lasting empire or edifice through their actions. You know, either that they will secure that long peace through their victory or lasting prosperity and safety for their country or for their religion or what it might be. And oftentimes there's this promise that after death, the soldiers will be rewarded with paradise, right? That's the kind of thing that motivates men to throw themselves into the reach of an enemy sword or his artillery fire. So it's as if the notions of a moral world, a metaphysical comfort about death, this idea that we can progress to something better, there are illusory means of motivating the will, right? A, a wonderful example, famously, the Muslim general who conquered the uh, Zoroastrian Persians told them that they faced soldiers who loved death even more than the Persians loved life. So with these illusions, we instill a morality which makes us highly motivated and self-sacrificing. And without these illusions, what do we, we get nihilism and ambivalence about the questions of moral value and an unwillingness to fight to defend the social order. And so one might question it again by Nietzsche's own arguments, whether we need something like a Hegelian dream of reaching a higher state of being, if only as a powerful illusion by which to help us go on living and fighting for our existence. It's only a moral prejudice that the truth is worth more than mere appearance. It may even be the most badly proven assumption there is. And so if you're now unsure what to believe, I think that's the perfect state of mind for looking at the following passages. We're going to consider a couple passages from Thus Spoke Zarathustra about war. And I want to look at these now because they cause a lot of new readers to Nietzsche, a lot of problems in my experience. Because, you know, if you're new to Nietzsche and you're just starting to follow along by this point in book one of Zarathustra, you know, you probably have read and reread the prologue and the early aphorisms, and you're starting to think you understand what Zarathustra is saying. Maybe you think it's like existentialist or sort of a humanist sort of message. And then he starts talking about throwing your life away in battle and becoming great enough for the hatred and envy in your heart. And I think by the end of book one, for some people, it all seems very confusing. Um, you know, you're just beginning to grasp onto the idea of being a self-legislator and a creator and this freedom from the morality of the herd. And here he seems to be talking about like fighting and dying for the nation state or sacrificing your life, which might seem to contradict the self-directed morality that he's been outlining. So I love these passages because it's where Nietzsche throws you for a loop. And this is on war and warriors. I think we're finally ready to read this one because it would be a mistake to take everything here only literally, just as it would be to suggest there's no element of this that's not actually literally about war, which I think quite a bit of it is. So we're going to go through this entire section, uh, and then I'll sort of break down some elements of it, but I want to just read the whole thing. So here goes, quote, We do not want to be spared by our best enemies, nor by those whom we love thoroughly. So let me tell you the truth. My brothers in war, I love you thoroughly. I am and I was of your kind, and I am also your best enemy. So let me tell you the truth. I know of the hatred and envy in your hearts. You are not great enough not to know hatred and envy. Be great enough then not to be ashamed of them. And if you cannot be saints of knowledge, at least be its warriors. They are the companions and forerunners of such sainthood. I see many soldiers. Would that I saw many warriors. Uniform one calls what they wear. Would that what it conceals were not uniform. You should have eyes that always seek an enemy, your enemy. And some of you hate at first sight. Your enemy shall you seek. Your war shall you wage for your thoughts. And if your thought be vanquished, then your honesty should still find cause for triumph in that. You should love peace as a means to new wars, and the short peace more than the long. To you, I do not recommend work but struggle. To you, I do not recommend peace but victory. Let your work be a struggle. Let your peace be a victory. One can be silent and sit still only when one has bow and arrow, else one chatters and quarrels. Let your peace be a victory. 
You say it is the good cause that hollows even war. I say unto you, it is the good war that hollows any cause. War and courage have accomplished more great things than love of neighbor. Not your pity, but your courage has so far saved the unfortunate. What is good, you ask? To be brave is good. Let the little girls say, to be good is what is at the same time pretty and touching. They call you heartless, but you have a heart, and I love you for being ashamed to show it. You are ashamed of your flood, while others are ashamed of their ebb. You are ugly? Well, then, my brothers, wrap the sublime around you, the cloak of the ugly. And when your soul becomes great, then it becomes prankish, and in your sublimity there is sarcasm. I know you. In sarcasm, the prankster and the weakling meet, but they misunderstand each other. I know you. You may only have enemies whom you can hate, not enemies you despise. You must be proud of your enemy. Then the successes of your enemy are your successes too. Recalcitrance. That is the nobility of the slaves. Your nobility should be obedience. Your very commanding should be in obeying. To a good warrior thou shalt sounds more agreeable than I will. And everything you like, you should first let yourself be commanded to do. Your love of life shall be the love of your highest hope, and your highest hope shall be the highest thought of your life. Your highest thought, however, you should receive as a command from me. And it is, man is something to be overcome. Thus live your life of obedience and war. What matters long life? What warrior wants to be spared? I do not spare you. I love you thoroughly, my brothers in war. Thus spoke Zarathustra. End quote. So a few immediate observations or things I'd like to draw your attention to. Just as I said that it's difficult to try and interpret the entire passage strictly as metaphor, because some people might say that this is could be interpreted for being a spiritual or it's a passage about a philosophical warrior or something of the like. It's also difficult to interpret it in, in solely literal terms, though. This might seem like a fairly obvious point to some of you to reiterate, but you'd be shocked how often people will insist on interpreting something in Nietzsche only as a literal statement or only as a metaphorical statement. Um, I think we should keep in mind, Thus Spoke Zarathustra imitates the style of the Bible, particularly the New Testament, and Nietzsche knew his biblical exegesis. He does a couple sections critiquing biblical exegesis in Daybreak. And he's very familiar with the versatility, we'll say, of the Bible. The fact that so many statements in the Bible can be interpreted in different ways. That some people will take a statement of Jesus figuratively, whereas others will take it literally. And so I think it's clear that Nietzsche writes Zarathustra with that awareness in mind of that each line could be taken figuratively or literally. And I think he intends, he therefore invests intention into both of the potential meanings. And so when Zarathustra says, my brothers in war, is he specifically addressing warriors or is he including all those who are waging the same war that Zarathustra is waging? A war against morality rather than a literal war for physical territory, right? Again, I think... It's something instructive to consider in untangling this is that for Nietzsche, war is this fundamental reality. It's the way he describes the revealed character of the world, the world itself. And so in some sense, the moral war waged by Nietzsche in the philosophical realm is a manifestation of the same underlying pattern that is realized in the world when, for example, um, young men from the United States were over there dropping bombs in the people of Vietnam, Right. Same underlying pattern, a struggle between opposing wills for dominance or opposing ideologies for dominance. It's just different manifestations of the same thing in different ways. So there's a literal meaning to almost everything he says that applies to actual warfare and real life warriors. But there's also an esoteric meaning for the future philosophers that I think Nietzsche believed to be an analogous meaning. Right, a corresponding meaning that occurs within the realm of philosophy, within one's own search for truth. So to both the literal soldier and the warrior in service of the truth, he says he sees too many soldiers and not enough warriors. And that's, of course, reminiscent of his remarks about 
for example, the scholarly drones of academia, in distinction to a, a true philosopher. So there's the true warrior of spirit, and then the person who's simply like a rank-and-file soldier, or, or like a fighter for hire, a mercenary type of person. Somebody who does the job because it's a job, right? So instead of someone like that, who is just an empty suit, that's the phrase we have in English, right? Um, he's just the uniform. Nietzsche says he wishes that what the uniform conceals is not uniform. So, you know, the individuality of a free spirit, it's the image of a person who, he does put himself into the existing structure and becomes one among many. But beneath the social role has this depth of personality that he maintains control over is another point. If we remember Nietzsche's remarks uh, in some of the earliest episodes in the season that we talked about, sort of like his idea of nobility, just like control over one's will, meaning like self-control to the highest degree that, um, you know, even when, when a noble spirited person loses control, it's within their will to do so. And so he accordingly addresses the warrior as like a noble near the end of the passage, right? Now, whichever level of analysis we wish to use, whether we're addressing either the literal or the figurative warrior, Zarathustra's guidance in this passage, the main advice he gives is to find an enemy. And he says he knows of the hatred and envy in our hearts, and he wishes that we were great enough not to know hatred and envy, but since that's not possible, he wishes we can be great enough not to be ashamed of them. Now that is a huge, like very important line right there. I think it, it strikes at the heart of so many things about Nietzsche's broader philosophical project. Um, it almost boggles my mind, uh, this line. The entire pretext of his work in Thus Spoke Zarathustra is this like new conception of the overman, right? Of an earthly horizon for mankind to reach for, this embodiment of our ideal future, um, this embodied figure who represents this worldly morality of Nietzsche, uh, that he's creating this figure to, um, it's our own, con our new conception of the sacred, right? A, a material or worldly conception of the sacred. And so that involves transforming ourselves into something beyond the limitations of current human beings, which means some parts of humanity will have to die or be destroyed. So our hatred and our envy, for example, these are other directed feelings. And even though Nietzsche sees envy as, for example, a great motivator for the ancient Greeks, something which helped define their civilization and helped lead to greatness, their accomplishments in the arts and in playwriting and so on and so forth, it's still something to be gotten over. Because to be moved at all by one's judgment of others in the comparisons that we draw between ourselves and others, this is still ultimately a form of dependence. It's if Nietzsche's higher human being is to be totally free and totally independent, which means their actions completely align with their will and with their convictions, then such a person shouldn't be able to be moved to a different course of action uh, by you know the feeling of being envious of another person. That would make them less independent, less free, less of a self-legislator in determining their own course in life. So envy is something to be overcome just as hatred and revenge and all these other ugly aspects of mankind that at various points Nietzsche speaks of overcoming. And that's an aspect of Nietzsche's philosophy, which I think is often not sufficiently talked about. The other side of the coin, though, is just like with our violent impulses or our sexual impulses, our tendency to measure ourselves in respect to the position of others, right? Envy or our capacities for hatred and, and jealousy. These are part of the human heart. And what should you do if you do have hatred and envy in your heart? Should you pretend that you don't have them, that you don't have these emotions or motivations? Uh, Nietzsche says, no, you shouldn't even be ashamed of them, right? And so in a way, it's the first step towards overcoming these things, not being ashamed of them. Therefore, you're able to look at them with honesty and sincerity, but it's that interesting two-sidedness of Nietzsche that um, recognize that it's something to be overcome, but don't be ashamed of it. In relation to the broader passage, Nietzsche expands this into the hatred one feels for his enemy in war, but he says to only hate your enemy and not to despise him. What does this mean? Not to condemn one's enemy morally, but to 
recognize in one's enemy that there's something admirable and something valuable, that one's enemy even does something beneficial for you. It's, it's the stone that you're sharpening your sword against, right? It's something that is making you stronger. He then, in this passage, inverts the message of Jesus, right? Um, that uh, in terms of like where he says that courage has done a better job of protecting the helpless than the love of the neighbor, right? Christianity and the message of Jesus is that turning the other cheek is the means of protecting the helpless, right? Uh, to In other words, instill a morality of harmlessness, right? That is the means of putting a stop to harm. Nietzsche says that it's always been courage that has spared the weak from harm. Zarathustra rather plainly calls courage good in this passage. It just says that's good, right? Again, as he says at the end of Genealogy of Morality's uh, first essay, he never intended to go beyond good and bad, only good and evil, right, in the Christian sense, in the sense of these moral categories which have an opposite essence to them. Here, flowing from this understanding that the world is war, right, that this is the revealed character of the world, uh, perhaps the most succinct way of stating that Heracleitean view of reality, well, in that world, courage is good. Courage is how one succeeds in war, and therefore that's how life goes on. So it's good in the sense that you might say life itself is good. It's just sort of like a, a truism, right? Um, or it's just sort of a axiomatic statement by brute force. Um, perhaps the most challenging part of the passage is where Nietzsche says that it's not a good cause that hollows any war, but war that hollows any cause. It's a reversal of our own assessment, right? Um, it's pretty much just a direct reversal of how we tend to think about war today. Um, you know, we the, the view of modernity is like we all despise war, but we recognize it as a necessity when it's hollowed by the just cause of, for example, protecting the helpless or self-defense or something of the like, then it becomes a just war. For Nietzsche, there's no just or unjust war, right? Just as there's no justice or injustice in nature, in the state of nature. The cause is made just instead by the willingness of the group to go to war over it, right? Again, this is perspectivism, people, right? The people with the resolve to commit their lives to a valuation they've made are the ones who are justified in their cause because the only true justification of your cause is winning, right? The history is written by the victors and so on. So it doesn't matter what the loser's moral assessment of the cause is. The winner of the conflict will determine what was justified and not justified. Now, is this a might makes right understanding of morality? I would could see question coming up, right? Well, parts of this passage, yeah, pretty much come dangerously close to that. But I want to turn the question back around on its hypothetical asker, and we could follow up that question with, is evolution a might makes right process? Is it right for a parasite like the Sipo Matador to strangle the life out of a beautiful towering tree in the Brazilian rainforest? only for the both the vine and the tree to both collapse and die. Only after the Sipa Matador has unfolded its crown and dispersed its seeds, but they both die in the end. So would not the tree call that morally wrong if the tree had capacity to call things morally right or wrong, right? Nietzsche here is applying the logic of, for instance, Machiavelli, who deals first and foremost in the realities of managing states and marshalling armies for war, and accordingly leaves the moral question aside. Um, we might recall one of his better coinages from Daybreak, um, the aphorism, truth requires power, where Nietzsche says, that's already been proved more than sufficiently by history, that the truth of a proposition has no bearing on whether it flourishes. It always has to win power over to its side. That's how it flourishes. Um, and so it's simply to treat um, the truth, again, not as something which is sought through dispassionate use of the intellect, but as something that is sort of like proven by its survivability or by its strength. Um, let's move on to an even more surprising passage. Uh, to new readers to Nietzsche, still in book one of Zarathustra, and it's only a few passages later, near the end of the book, entitled On the Voluntary Death. 
Um, okay, so, uh, oh, and this is going to be a, an abridged reading. Uh, I've cut out a few bits, uh, just in the interest of time and all that. So, quote, Many die too late, and a few die too early. The doctrine still sounds strange. Die at the right time. Die at the right time, thus teaches Zarathustra. Of course, how could those who never live at the right time die at the right time? Would that they had never been born. Thus I counsel the superfluous. But even the superfluous still make a fuss about their dying, and even the hollowest nut still wants to be cracked. Everybody considers dying important, but as yet death is no festival. As yet men have not learned how one hollows the most beautiful festivals. I show the death that consummates, a spur and a promise to the survivors. He that consummates his life dies his death victoriously, surrounded by those who hope and promise. Thus one should learn to die, and there should be no festival where one dying does not hollow the oaths of the living. To die thus is best. Second to this, however, is to die fighting, and to squander a great soul. But equally hateful to the fighter and the victor is your grinning death, which creeps up like a thief, and yet comes as the master." Some become too old even for their truths and victories. A toothless mouth no longer has the right to every truth. Would that there came preachers of quick death. I would like them as the true storms and shakers of the trees of life. But I hear only slow death preached, and patience with everything earthly. Verily, that Hebrew died too early, whom the preachers of slow death honor. And for many it has become a calamity that he died too early. And yet he knew only tears and the melancholy of the Hebrew and the hatred of the good and the just. The Hebrew Jesus, then the longing for death overcame him. Would that he had remained in the wilderness and far from the good and the just. Perhaps he would have learned to live and to love the earth, and laughter too. Believe me, my brothers, he died too early. He himself would have recanted this teaching had he reached my age. Noble enough was he to recant, but he was not yet mature. That your dying be no blasphemy against man and earth, my friends, that I ask of the honey of your soul. In your dying, your spirit and virtue should still glow like a sunset around the earth, else your dying has turned out badly. Thus I want to die myself, that you, my friends, may love the earth more for my sake, and to the earth I want to return, that I may find rest in her, who gave birth to me. End quote. So, the first thing I want to point out is that line, to die fighting or to die in battle, however you want to render it, and to squander a great soul, it's a wonderful turn of phrase because it still speaks of the self-sacrifice of war in wasteful terms. Because as Nietzsche writes in Beyond Good and Evil, nature is indifferent. It is wasteful beyond measure. It's also abundant beyond measure, but it's wasteful beyond measure all at once because plenty of things are wasted in nature. You know, entire species go off into non-existence when they become, become you know, unable to compete in the evolutionary arms race. So the thought of applying even this aspect of nature to ourselves seems somewhat horrifying, but I think accepting the eventual certainty of one's death and deciding then to die beautifully or die at a climactic time for Nietzsche, that it's something that can be paradoxically life-affirming, that one could make their death an act of will, just as their life was an act of will. One of the only settings where one can do this, of course, is war, and the undertones of self-sacrifice and war sort of lace this passage. And it ends on that beautiful note that invokes the idea of a return to nature, right? But in the sense of nature having reclaimed our individuated form, right? Take takes its payment, which is our death, in exchange for our having stolen our existence by becoming something separate and individual and conscious. This the sort of terms that, you know, the pre-Platonics sometimes talked about, uh, used to talk about life and death. Now, we can't go over this passage without considering how Nietzsche regards the death of Jesus. Jesus died too early, a criticism echoed in the Antichrist, some die too late, some die too young, and Jesus' death was simply too early for the 
completion of his life. Um, it's a really blasphemous idea from a Christian standpoint that Jesus's life wasn't in every way perfect, right? Because if Nietzsche's saying if he had lived a little longer, he would have repudiated his own teachings, and he should have spent more time in the wilderness, Zarathustra says. And of course, the term in German for wilderness literally means desert. Um, that's where Jesus goes to be tempted, off into the solitude of the desert or the wilderness. That's where he encounters Satan, and in the stories, you know, defeats Satan, resists his temptation. Um, but that's another interesting aspect of sort of Nietzsche's philosophy in its opposition to Christianity, because Nietzsche says solitude is enlivening. It's part of a painful process of developing an independent spirit. Um, and that's why solitude for the Christian is, it's a dangerous thing, right? It's something you should r regard, uh, as, you know, one, one shouldn't put themselves out outside of the laws that govern mankind and, make oneself removed from the social consciousness that tells you what's right and wrong, right? One might be tempted to their baser animal impulses. Um, and, you know, we might also think of how Nietzsche says that one of the names that could be applied to his free spirits is that they're tempters and attempters, experimenters with morality who also sort of tempt others to do so. So if Jesus had spent more time in solitude and lived to be a bit older, um, Nietzsche says he was noble enough, he was wise enough to recognize the error of life denial in all good time. And um, he says he would have learned to, to laugh. There's a great uh, coinage by Cornell West where he says, Socrates never cries and Jesus never laughed. And that there's a very deep meaning behind that. I don't know if I've fully figured it out, but I think on an intuitive level, maybe I, I, I think I kind of get it, but Jesus never laughs in the new Testament. Right. Uh, and for Nietzsche laughter is like one, it's like a sacrament. Right. And so in some cases we might say that one who died too early, maybe just sort of wasted their potential. But with Jesus, it's much of a bigger issue than that because it's his death that had such an impact on the Western psyche. Right. That's the great event by which, the whole calendar is reorganized, right? Our moral universe is reorganized. This this world becomes the place where the just man is tortured to death. And happiness becomes reconceived as attainable only within the kingdom of heaven. And so it's Jesus' death and the legend that springs up around it that has this effect. And it's worth considering in that book, uh, The Antichrist of Nietzsche, Nietzsche criticizes the viewpoint of Imre Nan, that Jesus fit the psychological type of the hero. Nietzsche writes that the hero is perhaps the farthest personality type from that of Jesus, um, reasoning that the turn of phrase, resist not evil, is itself the distillation of the morality of the Gospels. There couldn't be anything less heroic than that, right? To turn the other cheek make oneself small, humble, harmless, and so on. That's the opposite of the heroic. And, uh, you know, the, the heroic invites, uh, you know, in the sense of the Greek Olympians, right? It invites you to make yourself larger than life and courageous and strong. And so Jesus, in many ways, rep he, um, what would you say? He models the inversion of courage, um, finding the strength to endure pain and suffering in absence of giving resistance to it. Instead of bringing your opposing will to bear against the source of your pain and suffering and fighting against it, instead to let yourself be overwhelmed, let yourself be martyred, or simply suffer under it and, uh, you know, glory in the forbearance, your ability to, to, to bear your suffering well, right? And render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, waiting in hopes of your reward for being a submiss submissive person, Right? Uh, you live your entire life that way, waiting for a reward which is to come in the afterlife. So instead, in this passage, as well as the other one we looked at in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, we have this exaltation of courage. And the reason why I've stressed the literal aspects of these passages again and again is because courage only really means something when there's real danger or risk involved. So we could talk about things like intellectual courage, um, it's something we might be tempted to invoke as the true meaning of this passage, right? But do we really know intellectual courage? You know, does one really have a kind of courage unless it's actually comparable 
to the type of courage that is expressed on the battlefield. You know, in other words, if one is risking life and limb on account of their courage. So in this understanding of courage, intellectual courage can't just be writing a a triggering, edgy comment online anonymously. It means putting your life and limb on the line for your ideas or for your words, right? How many of you are willing to do that? The, the kind of courage that Zarathustra is celebrating here is the willingness to put everything on the line, risk it all, succumb to danger, and do so because, again, death is certain. It concludes every life, and it's better than to die beautifully in a way that consummates your life and the message of your life, the aim of your life, or the artistic vision of your life even, whatever it might be, than simply to go on living for the sake of going on living. And furthermore, that by dying in such a way, in a way that accepts and even sort of celebrates the finitude of life, um, with by embracing death, when it come, when you recognize that the time to die has come, well, one celebrates life by that same means. Their death becomes a festival and a celebration of life itself. They're dying in order to complete their life and fully become who they are. And if you do cling on to life that's no escape from danger. It's instead a different kind of danger. That's the danger the Greeks would have warned you against, the danger of becoming old and mild and mellow, of feeling your physical prowess decline and your body begin to wear down. And naturally, in this state, the consciousness, which still clings on to life just as dearly as it did at 20 years of age, begins to look every which way in search of a world beyond this one, because this just can't be all there is. Maybe when you were young and passionate and so fired up and full of love for life that you didn't even care if you died, that you still had the illusion of immortality, and so you were willing to throw your life away for a cause or for love or whatever the reason, without even the thought of what came after, you know, you shook free of your mortal coil. Well, maybe then you could have tolerated the idea of parting from the world. But when you grow old and you feel your life like slowly drain from you, that's when you're in danger of getting seduced by a true world. And Nietzsche believed he saw this with Wagner, and he warned in the 1886 preface to Birth of Tragedy, this is likely how all of you will end. Even those of us who count ourselves among his free spirits, right, may well end our lives with the aid of metaphysical comforts, the comfort that this is not all there is. And this, for Nietzsche, is the very reason why we shouldn't live too long. One should die blessing the world and blessing life, yet not clinging to it because they know death is the natural end of every life. It's the completion of their life. Um, And therefore, it's death can't be a reason to condemn life or lay a curse upon it. And so these are all very nice sentiments from Nietzsche, but remember what he's using these words to encourage. He's saying, hey, it might be quite appropriate for you to go die in battle somewhere, Put your life in danger for the sake of a great dream and accept that you'll die in the process. And Nietzsche perhaps nowhere puts this better than in one of the most famous passages of his entire canon, which appears in The Gay Science. You'll recognize uh, the famous quotation from it once I get to that sentence, but this section is called Preparatory Human Beings, as Kaufman renders it. It's often translated as Pioneers. It's from the fourth book of The Gay Science, and the term pioneers is actually quite an apt translation. It's better than Kaufman's because Nietzsche was very much employing the metaphors of the conquistadores, uh, the early explorers of the new world, such as Christopher Columbus, right, during this time in his writing, because he's he's writing book four in Genoa, in the place uh, from which the, all the voyages to the new world were launched. And so these are the kind of people like clearing the pathway for man to be overcome, these preparatory human beings. But the metaphor is like the idea of a pioneer or uh, someone venturing into a new world. Um, He's drawing a lot of that metaphor from where he is in the time that he's writing. And what Nietzsche says is that a more virile, warlike age is approaching, and he celebrates this fact. So here it is. This is uh, The Gay Science uh, 283, one of the best passages in the book, and I'm reading Kaufman's translation, quote, I welcome all signs that a more virile, warlike age is about to begin, which will restore honor to courage above all. 
For this age shall prepare the way for one yet higher, and it shall gather the strength that this higher age will require some day, the age that will carry heroism into the search for knowledge, and that will wage wars for the sake of ideas and their consequences. End quote. Uh, pause here. Yet again, we have the celebration of the warrior, but then the immediate relation of this to a war in a philosophical sense. And I guess, again, the underlying insight is that a war is always a war of ideas, right? Since different tables of values hang over different peoples, and it's by those means that people distinguish themselves from one another, right? By their different ideas, their different languages, their different notions of the sacred, and so on. And so war is always a literal battle for territory or resources, but the way the two sides define who's a friend and who's an enemy within the conflict, that has to do with how they define their values, their ide their ideas, and their identity, which is defined in sort of contrast to everyone else. So the war, the physical war is always a war of ideas, and the war of ideas is a manifestation of the physical war simply in the realm of ideas, if that makes any sense. Okay, uh, back to the text. Quote, To this end, we now need many preparatory, courageous human beings who cannot very well leap out of nothing, any more than out of the sand and slime of present-day civilization and metropolitanism. Human beings who know how to be silent, lonely, resolute, and content, and constant in invisible activities. Human beings who are bent on seeking in all things for what in them must be overcome. Human beings distinguished as much by cheerfulness, patience, unpretentiousness, and contempt for all great vanities, as by magnanimity and victory and forbearance regarding the small vanities of the vanquished. Human beings whose judgment concerning all victors and the share of chance in every victory and fame is sharp and free. Human beings with their own festivals, their own working days, and their own periods of mourning, accustomed to command with assurance but instantly ready to obey when that is called for. Equally proud, equally serving their own cause in both cases. More endangered human beings, more fruitful human beings, happier beings. For believe me, the secret for harvesting from existence the greatest fruitfulness and the greatest enjoyment is to live dangerously. Build your cities on the slopes of Vesuvius. Send your ships into uncharted seas. Live at war with your peers and yourselves. Be robbers and conquerors as long as you cannot be rulers and possessors, you seekers of knowledge. Soon the age will be past when you could be content to live hidden in forests like shy deer. At long last, the search for knowledge will reach out for its due. It will want to rule and possess, and you with it. End quote. So once again, Nietzsche makes clear particularly toward the end, that his message is of particular importance to the seeker after knowledge. But also, he derives that wisdom from, as he put it in that other passage, the military school of life. And here it's one of his most famous sayings, such that a lot of people don't even know they're quoting Nietzsche when they say it, live dangerously. And he means this quite literally, put yourself in danger, danger in the alley, danger in the heart, right? It's another turn of phrase from Beyond Good and Evil. That is what will make you better. That is what will create you as a person. And while so much in that passage, I, I think doesn't even really bear elaborating upon, both because it's fairly straightforward and because my own words would just be a more clumsy paraphrase of what was already better said, there's a very important aspect that I want you to consider more closely uh, as a sort of a final thought in this episode. Make war on your peers and on yourselves. That is part of Nietzsche's message. This recalls his assessment of Schopenhauer in Schopenhauer as Educator, um, that Schopenhauer became a heroic philosopher by his solitary nature, or through his solitary nature, by disregarding the opinions of the many and seeking his own truth, uh, whatever the cost, and therefore by making war upon his own happiness, by deciding that his philosophizing, his reasoning would never yield nor bow to what his desires told him or to what comforted him, to what he wished to be true. Instead, he sought for the truths that were the hardest. That was his form of heroism. There's a concept in Islam 
many of you might be aware of called jihad or spiritual struggle. There's the outer jihad, which could involve a literal physical conflict with other human beings, you know, in defense of the religion or to spread the religion. And various schools of Islam have different takes on what that entails exactly, but we're all roughly familiar with the term in that sense, I would imagine. But there's also an inner jihad, an inner struggle within the self against one's own waywardness or sinfulness. And while Nietzsche doesn't think in terms of sin, he does think in terms of self-overcoming, there are aspects of all of us which we wish to overcome, and Nietzsche's advice to us, again, not to hate ourselves or be ashamed of those aspects of ourselves that we want to sort of burn away in the transformation. Um, you know, he reminds us to accept those parts of ourselves that we cannot change and to honestly confront the aspects that we can. But this is within the context of a view of the world in which life is war. Existence is war. It's a struggle, and each of us lives in a sort of war or struggle, not only with contending with other beings in the world, but also within ourselves, for which, you know, which drives or impulses will rule and harness our will for its ends, for example, right? And so unlike those ideologies like Buddhism or Epicureanism that seek to unbend the bow and release ourselves from the con constant sort of tension of this inner war by various different means, Nietzsche teaches us to embrace that war and recognize that the end of this conflict, that lasting peace, is something deadly. It's a form of slow death. As Kant jokes at the beginning of his essay, perpetual peace uh, is you know, the title of a picture of a graveyard, right? There's your perpetual peace. Now, if the question on our minds at the end of this talk is whether we can take these insights that kind of come out of the broadest, most abstract sense and use them as any argument to justify war in the literal, physical, violent sense, I think you're approaching this, or you're approaching this question, I think, the wrong way. Uh, war is not justified or unjustified in Nietzsche's view. Again, war is the world. If you want to go on living in the world, then it's justified. Simple as that. But in another deeper sense, there is no natural justice for Nietzsche. That would require the moral equality of organisms with mutually exclusive views on what the good is, right? The moral equality of the lion and the gazelle. If we're in a life or death, death struggle where if you get what you want, I die, and if I get what I want, you die, reason can't settle this conflict. Nietzsche thinks that that's simply an incorrect way of looking at things. Conflict is an irreducible aspect of the world's character that's replicated on its every level. And so in the natural world, in the social world, in the world of ideas, and even within ourselves, our own inner life and conscience, it's all war. It's war all the way down. But that's a really uncomfortable thought for all of us who've been brought up into this worldview in which the highest good is peace, you know, the Sabbath of Sabbaths and the deliverance from all strife and suffering. And I would say we've spent the better part of a century now trying to prove the opposite case, that war is something that can be overcome. I mean, as we talked about, it's like you have to have the strength to confront the things you can overcome and the sort of serenity to accept the parts of uh, human nature, which we can't. And that's, again, the same question remains. Is war one of those things that can be changed or is it not? Um, Nietzsche would, I think, always hold fast to the idea that it can't be changed, that war is life and without war, there is no life. And woe to the people that totally removes itself from the pursuit of war. And perhaps more importantly, if we begin to see war as something that is this revealed character of existence, you can begin to see it everywhere. And I mean, I don't mean to imply we've totally gotten rid of violent conflict, but so many of us today living in modernity will espouse the belief that violence is always wrong and accordingly that war is always wrong. But do we not have war even now, do we not have our gladiatorial games, our competitions and sports and games of skill? I mean, what is MMA fighting? What is boxing? What is American football, if not war? What about politics? Has the partisanship within our political system not become a mentality of warfare? What about economics, war by other means? What about social media, where there are countless keyboard warriors, as we call them, are we not just yearning at all times for some release of our warlike tendencies to like overwhelm and conquer and destroy the enemy? 
It's just like with our cruelty, even though we've made it more nuanced and more hidden and more subtle, it has not gone away. We morally permit war in basically every manifestation now, except for violent conflict. The question remains whether this is a state of affairs that can be maintained or whether war in the traditional sense of the word, the violent physical sense, will eternally recur. I think that about covers Nietzsche's views on war. Um, in addition to, I, I've tried to like take it into the abstract a little bit more with this episode because, um, you know, I think we've kind of covered how war fits in politically throughout the season. But I think this will sort of like help explain certain things morally. Um, you know, much of this probably could have been gleaned from some of the other episodes, but if you've listened to every episode up to this point, you probably could have figured out a lot of this on your own, but we're not going to do a whole season on political philosophy and not do an episode about Nietzsche's views on war. I mean, come on, that would be crazy. But actually I do really like how in Nietzsche's writing, he relates this topic to so many other things, or it's another area in which Nietzsche's ideas are all sort of interconnected in a way. And after all, we got to look at a famous passage in his work, one of the most famous, um, that we've never covered before in any detail, the Pioneer's Passage, Live Dangerously, right? And here's 70 episodes in, and we hadn't covered it. Fantastic, right? For me, that's a badge of honor to not do an episode where we analyze the Live Dangerously passage until the 70th episode of the podcast, right? Because that's why you come here. You come here for the deep cuts. <laughs> okay. All right. That's all, everyone. Uh, thank you. Good night. Signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.